Good evening, and thank you for having me. I'm Ken Hirsch, the CEO of the George W. Bush Presidential Center in Dallas. And I have the, and I have the honor to represent the Bush family and the Bush Institute here today. I'd like to talk about the confusing time in which we live. Why, amidst such good economic and employment news, we've seen such a rise in populism, nativism, and division. Simply, I've asked myself a question. If things are so good, why do we feel so anxious? At its core, I believe the answer lies in the three forces that are at play today. The first is the fiscal realities coming out of the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis are squarely upon us. There's a demographic shift occurring in our country, and the accelerating pace of technological change is everywhere. These three forces have set up an intergenerational conflict that is challenging groups of Americans in ways we haven't seen. First, over money. 83 million millennials who will comprise 75% of the workforce in the year 2030, are now aware that the baby boomers have left them with a $22 trillion debt bomb, along with unsustainable levels of student debt, as well as underfunded pensions and a social security system that is nowhere near sustainable. Second, there's a conflict over different perspectives of the system and how it serves. The system generally worked for the baby boomers, who enjoyed the post-World War II, post-Cold War prosperity despite a couple of financial crises. The market-based institutions generally held, and most promises will be kept to that generation. And that generation had it better than the prior. Versus millennials' anxiety about the future, a majority of whom came of age during or after the global financial crisis, and they haven't enjoyed that prosperity. 49% of millennials surveyed say that the global financial crisis changed the way they think about saving, investing, and spending. At the same time, this group is more connected, more fragmented, more diverse, more technologically savvy, and less defined by political labels than any generation in human history. 64% believe that government should do more to solve problems, Yet 48% of millennials identify as independents, making it hard to channel those demands. And they increasingly feel that the system is rigged in favor of the rich and connected. Plus, there is now added demand that social outcomes, not just market ones, are worth balancing. In addition to this intergenerational conflict, we're seeing clashes between two worlds in which we both live. And that causes anxiety for everyone, not just millennials and it's the conflict between the fast world and the slow world. The fast world values speed. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said it best in 2018 when he said, things have never moved this fast and they will never again move this slow. The fast world is all around us. Artificial intelligence, robotics, instant journalism, gene editing, cryptocurrencies, and quantum computing speeds 100 million times faster than today's semiconductors are just a few years away. The slow world values truth and accuracy and consensus over speed. And examples of those in our lives are three branches of government with its checks and balances, a parliamentary system based on coalitions, the multilateral institutions like the UN and the EU, multi-party agreements like NAFTA and the Paris Accord. Juries are a slow, deliberate mechanism to find truth. The scientific process with peer review and double-blind studies sacrifices speed in order to get to accuracy. Even declaring war rightly requires an act of Congress, so there's due deliberation. These worlds are different, and they're defined by differing views of disruption. In the fast world, disruption has positive connotations. Innovation, wealth creation, creative destruction, efficiency gains. We strive for those. In the slow world, disruption has negative connotations from the implied loss of control. Usually these worlds are far apart, and they're far apart in all of our lives, but today they are starting to collide, and they're colliding without rules of engagement. The fast world in our news and politics favors getting your message out and getting it viral. It makes loud more important than true. In our financial system, Blockchain and cryptocurrencies could disrupt established monetary control mechanisms. 
In our geopolitics, for example, where foreign powers are able to use the slow world's values of transparency and freedom of expression against itself to meddle in elections. In our national security, where the instruments of war are changing to automated drones and cyber warfare, combatants need not be on the battlefield. And there are no rules of engagement for this world. We're used to Geneva Conventions on the treatment of prisoners or treaties on the use of chemical weapons, but there's no Geneva Convention for artificial intelligence. How these worlds do battle will define the next 20 years on this planet. China and Russia, they know what they're doing. They view the slow world as superior, and there is no doubt who controls the data or the network. In the US, we are struggling for an answer. We love the open internet. We love the convenience it enables until we actually see and experience how it could threaten us and invade our privacy or even threaten established institutions. The result is anxiety, completely independent of our economic condition. And it's due to the realization, I believe, that things that used to be axiomatic or givens are now open to question. What can we believe in? First, our eyes. Can we trust them? Real versus unprofessional journalism and the emergence of news generated by automated bot farms in far off places cause us, cause us to doubt what we read or hear. The majority of Americans today don't view media as credible, any media. Second, we see increased debates about capitalism with a new generation as being the best way to allocate resources and lift all boats. For a post-World War II Cold War generation that has seen markets lift two billion people out of poverty and enhance human dignity, this seems foreign. But many haven't felt those positive effects and want to debate the system itself. Now that framework is being challenged, even while places like Venezuela are imploding. Today, 51% of the 18 to, 19, 20, 18 to 29 year olds have a favorable view towards socialism. Capitalist is becoming a dirty word. Third, do we have to worry that we won't be living in a democracy here at home? The Bush Institute's national 2018 study on democracy done in conjunction with the Penn Biden Center and the Freedom House is worrisome. We found that a majority in this country feel that our democracy is weak and getting weaker. 50% feel that, quote, there is a real danger of the US becoming a non-democratic authoritarian country. And globally, the trend is worrisome as well. Freedom House reports democracies are globally in retreat. And finally, how do we improve our post-World War II institutions to adapt to today's challenges? The UN, the WTO, the EU, and even NATO are having meaningful internal debates about priorities and practices among their own members. Ironically and tragically, at a time when, these, when we need these institutions the most, they're at their weakest and as declines in trust elsewhere have become significant. With these challenges to the axiomatic principles upon which most of us were raised, were taught, and have lived, it is no wonder that people who feel threatened resort to tribal instincts, where divisions are accentuated and hatred and intolerance find a voice. People who fear being disrupted want to act out and blame somebody. So how do we get out of this problem? Principled leadership is the answer. Without principles, our leaders are little more than a mood ring on the hand of the American people. Having a true North set of values is the key ingredient in dealing effectively with unscripted moments. I have been honored to work with President Bush, who regardless of whether or not you agreed with him, you knew he followed his core values and worked for the best interests of the country. He always, He always instructed his staff to focus on what was best for the country, not to think in terms of red or blue. And that's true at the Bush Center as well. He led this country in the aftermath of 9-11, defined by his character, with a consistent message that we will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. Now, just as the US Treasury bill is the risk-free rate against which all corporate bonds are priced, in many respects, the office of the President of the United States is the political risk-free rate against which all global actors gauge. If the risk of that office increases, global risks are amplified.
President Bush has been consistent in reminding us that he says that the office of the presidency is more important than its occupant. In the future, in the future, new paradigms of leadership will require different talents. We've moved from a leader's role simply being one of managing through uncertainty to one of managing through the unknowable. Past patterns are no longer predictive in a world where quantum computing speeds 100 million times faster can answer a question before it is even asked. This world favors an approach that understands the limitations of government micromanagement and at the same time is socially tolerant and protects that tolerance. Both government's capacity and resources are limited and markets, while not perfect, have been the greatest anti-poverty program ever. Focusing on expanding opportunity with government taking a role ensuring that markets behave fairly leads to compassionate outcomes. Government must be smarter and efficient to solve the problems without increasing dependence. And socially tolerant because it is right. We now serve a population less defined by labels, which is more fragmented and more connected and more skeptical of institutions than any in modern history. And this generation can vote with their feet more quickly than ever. And this generation will only tolerate pointing that moral compass at protecting human freedom. That is why the work of the ADL and the Bush Institute is so important. Tolerance, compassion, and freedom go together. They are the essence of our civil society. For President Bush, that is the essence of compassionate conservatism. He saw it early, and you saw it in the video from a speech in 2002. As Jackie Robinson explained, life is not a spectator sport. If you're gonna spend your whole life in the grandstand just watching what goes on, you're wasting your life. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for the future, not anxious. The current political environment has re-energized society in the public square, and for a democracy, that's healthy. We're living in an age of discovery. There are extraordinary things being done by ordinary people all over the country. And compassionate leadership doesn't start with government. It ends there. The heavy lifting starts at the family and community level. So we all have a chance to be principled leaders where it counts the most. And I see non-viral stories all over the country of people doing the hard work of leading regardless of the need for having it to go viral. We are realizing that government mandates with, are imperfect at best for a country as diverse as ours. So if we work these values locally, our efforts will not be in vain. We will improve our lives and in the end it will trickle up since our government ultimately reflects our values. And we will continue to stand against bigotry, anti-Semitism, discrimination and intolerance. And and support those who share those values. At the Bush Center, we are working every day inspired by the values of President and Mrs. Bush and their public service. Based upon the principles of economic and political freedom, less government dependency, and a strong and compassionate country, our mission is to engage the world as we develop leaders, advance policy, and take action to address today's most pressing challenges. And we execute that mission through our three impact centers, domestic excellence, global leadership, in our engagement agenda, the first two which comprise the work of the Bush Institute. And I am proud of our joint messaging with ADL this year on freedom, democracy, and tolerance, and proud that groups traditionally on opposite sides of the political aisle can find commonality. In 2018, in April of 18, at the Bush Center, we inaugurated the George W. Bush Medal for Distinguished Leadership, and we gave it to Bono for his life of service outside of the stage. And we had Bono and President Bush together in Dallas for a black tie gala. I caught President Bush on a weak moment and he agreed to wear a tux. And they were talking to each other and Bono said to President Bush, you know, when we became friends, it wasn't really good for my fan base. <laughs> and then President Bush said, mine either. <laughs> and then Bono leaned forward in his beautiful Irish accent and he said, you know, in life, you don't have to agree on everything. You just have to agree on one thing. And you could hear a pin drop when he said that. And that's the opportunity that we have today. So thank you, Jonathan Greenblatt, for your friendship and your partnership.
It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague Holly Kuzmich and Mike Gerson to discuss how tolerance and civility go together. Holly has over two decades of public policy experience. She served in the Bush administration on the domestic policy team, in the Department of Education working on No Child Left Behind, as well as in several capacities on Capitol Hill. Now she's the executive director of the Bush Institute in Dallas, and I have the extreme honor of being able to come to work every day to help her lead her wonderful team as we advance important work. Under her guidance, our freedom and democracy work has turned its attention to the United States where our founding principles seem under attack. We are working to reassert the principles that make this country great. She will introduce Mike Gerson and the conversation. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the Executive Director of the Bush Institute, Ms. Holly Kuzmich. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having us, and I'm really pleased with our guests tonight for this conversation. I want to introduce you all to Michael Gerson, who I know as a former colleague of mine from my days on Capitol Hill and my time in the White House. You all will likely know him as a nationally syndicated columnist with the Washington Post. His work appears twice weekly there. He's a commentator on PBS NewsHour, on Face the Nation. Um, and you can find him writing and thinking about really important ideas in our country today. Uh, when he served with President Bush, he was the assistant to the president for policy and strategic planning, and he was the director of speech writing. So Mike, thank you for being here tonight. Glad to be here. So I first want to start off with that role that you had for President Bush. We all saw that video a few minutes ago of President Bush's remarks, and you held the power of the pen for him. Mm -hmm. How did you think about that role and the importance of that role, and not just what you wrote, but the impact of the words he said? Well, our job was to take a set of very definite values, you know, strong values of tolerance and um, commitment to democracy and human decency um, and empathy uh, and transform those into presidential rhetoric. Um, and it's actually a pretty extensive operation when you uh, put it all together. The president has anywhere from one to three public events a day uh, that he would require remarks for. And um, I had six writers working for me and fact checkers and researchers, and it's, it's a big operation, but uh, you know, I obviously focused on the big ones. So tell me about uh, knowing the, just all of the different things that President Bush faced, how you thought about really um, uh, writing his words um, and the importance of it and, and the gravitas of that. Well, I thought about it uh, first through the perspective po of policy. Um, I had been a policy geek on Capitol Hill, um, doing something called compassionate conservatism. Um, and uh, we were looking for ways to strengthen the civic sector to provide human services in a compassionate way. I worked for Dan Coates of Indiana, who you worked for as well right. at one point, um, uh, now the NDI. Um, but um, so I was attracted to him first from a policy perspective as, as his, uh, he was one of the people in the country developing a compassionate conservative ideology. And we were making a play for the soul of the Republican Party. Um, you know, I, when I went down the first time and met him in Austin, I said, I wrote down in my diary that I wanted to do two things. One is recover the recovery of American rhetoric. And the other one is recovery of compassion in the Republican Party. And I, that's what we tried to do in 2000, and I think in, you know, we succeeded in some ways. So. Can you, um, we were talking about this uh, just a bit earlier, that right after September 11th, President Bush uh, went, did that visit to the Islamic Center. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you actually didn't, he had talking points, not a speech. Right, exactly. But talk about that, the importance of that visit, the genesis of it, and the power of the message. Well, in his telling, which I've talked to him about it, um, this first came across his mind on September 12th, a day after 9-11, during the cabinet meeting that we had in response to the crisis, 
where Norm Mineta, um, Secretary Mineta, was sitting at that table, and he had been interned as a, as a Japanese American during World War II, um, and the president knew his story well. Um, and he says that he internally, at that point, made the decision, I'm gonna send the message that this is not gonna be like World War II. We are not gonna blame Muslims um, and people from the Middle East for these things. And he wanted to show it in some dramatic way. Um, and he is the one that did the impetus of, uh, of going to this mosque. Um, and I really think the speech was, was excellent, uh, largely his own creation. Um, but I also think that moment when six days after 9-11, the President of the United States took off his shoes and out of respect and entered a mosque was an important moment in the history of the presidency. Um, And this, this was, had been, you know, this was not new in a certain way. President Bush was the first president to mention the word mosque in an inaugural address. Um, he was the first presidential candidate to ever visit a mosque during his campaign. Um, and so I think it was important, it reflected his character. But I will also tell you, it also reflected part of our strategy, our uh, defense strategy going forward, which is we did not want the narrative to be what the other side wanted it to be, which is Islam against the West, mm -hmm. which uh, too many conservatives feed into that narrative. Yeah. The president wanted to be people of goodwill against murderous thugs. And that's the kind of narrative that we could win um, instead of declaring a, a conflict between civilizations, yeah. as, as some are, are willing to do. So I think it, it was important from a empathy perspective, but also important from a strategy perspective. You often write about the role of faith and religion in politics, and I, I would love to hear your thoughts about what that looks like today and the worries that you see um, in terms of using religious ideas to serve ideological purposes. I'm actually working on a book on the topic um, for Simon & Schuster, um, and it's brought me into contact with people from the history, from American history, that were motivated by a religiously informed vision of human dignity that made huge impact on our country in abolition, in women's rights, in uh, temperance, in the civil rights movement. This is one of the main ways that America became a more just place is by uh, the activity of people of faith who had a vision of human dignity that was not utilitarian, that was just uh, a, a shared and absolute commitment to human dignity. Um, right now, we're in a pretty, I think, dangerous moment in which uh, evangelical Christianity um, is in some ways discredited by its political associations and being used as a tool rather than as playing a prophetic role. You see the Catholic tradition um, discredited by their own history of abuse. You see uh, the Protestant mainline having lost members and influence greatly. And you see the African-American prophetic tradition, a disconnect from the younger generation, I think, um, who don't necessarily share those views and values. Um, a lot of people look at that and say, well, that's a good thing. We've finally gotten religious people out of politics. Um, but I look at it and think, Throughout our history, we have needed people who had, out of a religious belief, a certain anthropology, a certain view of human beings, their rights and dignity, um, and were willing to sacrifice on behalf of that vision. Um, it's easy in a society for society to become utilitarian, the greatest good for the greatest number. Okay? That always leads to the abuse of minorities. That is the destination of utilitarian thinking. And it's, I think it's essential to have somebody in a society. It's not just religious people who develop this, as we found at our founding. There are philosophic traditions that feed into this as well. But religion has been one of the most reliable sources of that vision. And it was a motivating factor the president and I worked for. 
was a motivating factor in his belief in human dignity and liberty. It was also a motivating factor in certain uh, policy prescriptions like uh, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, um, where the, uh, the largest uh, initiative to fight a single disease in human history. Um, and uh, you know, he did something because we could do something about it, and we did something because of his vision of human dignity informed by his faith. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, when you've, uh, obviously this issue of polarization is something that everybody's talking about today and that everybody's worried about. You talk about it in terms of dehumanizing people. Say more about that and, and where, well, it's, it's, where you're seeing that. You know, it starts as political polarization. Um, there's one fact from the, the last presidential election that I found very interesting, but 80% of counties in America in that election um, were landslide counties. They were either won by a landslide by Hillary Clinton or a landslide by Donald Trump. Um, and that is a, uh, most people in America lived in a place where all of their neighbors did what they did. Um, in the 1970s, that figure was more like 20%. You have people that are pulling away from each other politically, um, uh, morally, have very different views of the world. Um, can I read one quote that yeah. I just think is useful from, the, um, from Pew that uh, summarizes it a lot for me? These days, Democrats and Republicans no longer stop at disagreeing with each other's ideas. Many each part in each party now deny each other's facts, disapprove of each other's lifestyles, avoid each other's neighborhoods, impugn each other's moments, doubt uh, motives, doubt each other's patriotism, can't stomach each other's news sources, and bring different value systems to such core social institutions as marriage and parenthood. It is as if they belong not to rival parties, but to alien tribes. And I think that in many ways that's where we are. We have a political system then that was designed for disagreement, but is undermined by mutual contempt. And I think we've reached a stage where these disagreements have slipped over into contempt. Mm -hmm. And the next phase, or the last phase, not quite the last phase, but an important phase, is then dehumanization, where you essentially believe that uh, the people you oppose are not, don't have the same rights and values that you do, and, and uh, importance. And I think we have now a, uh, I, I don't want to get into the politics, but we have a lot of sources in our society now that are permission for prejudice, that are permission for discrimination. From political leadership, from the internet, from other places, they take it and normalize what should not be normal. And I, I think that we, we have to push back against that in some substantive ways. Right. So this question of politicians' role in this, are they the cause of it, or are they merely sort of exemplifying the feelings that are out there in our country? Well, briefly, I'll, I have a friend, Emil Bruno, at uh, University of Pennsylvania, who does uh, study, studies dehumanization. He's an expert on Hungarian politics. He found um, in the year that Orban and his party um, began their, their anti-immigrant rhetoric and built a barbed wire fence, um, that his measures of dehumanization doubled in a single year. That is what dehumanizing leadership can do. It's what I mean by giving permission. I, you know, I don't believe there are, for the most part, good people and evil people when it comes to these things. There are people that have a mix of good and evil that can be brought out under the right circumstances or the wrong circumstances. Um, and I think political leadership plays an important role in trying to strengthen what is good in the human character and human morality and to try to stigmatize what is destructive and hateful. And right now we have mixed messages. 
So we have, um, on issues like women's rights and LGBTQ rights and rights for the minority community, we've admittedly not made enough progress, but we've made some. Right. But we're seeing this resurgence of anti-Semitism. What do you see as some of the reasons for that in our country and around the world? Well, it's a, it's a difficult issue. Um, I look at the role of technology in the internet, which everyone talks about, and it is certainly true that everyone used to have a crazy uncle, and now a million crazy uncles can get together on the internet and support one another's insanity. That's really now technologically possible um, in ways that it hasn't been before. Um, but I also think, um, I do think that political leadership plays a role in all this. When you organize your political theory around resentment for the other, and that other can be migrants, it can be Muslims, it can be refugees, it could be our competitors in the world. Um, when you organize your politics about resentment for the other, then I think groups that have a strong identity and are, have been vulnerable in the past becomes vulnerable again. Um, that often happens. Um, and so I do think that politics plays an important role. I, th I think uh, technology plays an important role. And I, just, I also think that we have an institutional crisis. Of those institutions, that strong institutions, democratic institutions, religious institutions, that have traditionally pushed back against these ideas, um, people have lost faith in the institutions of our common life. And somehow we have to rebuild that faith and standing so that they can re-impose uh, the important moral stigmas in our common life. And that is a generational task to, to improve the standing and status of institutions. So you're now a member of one of these institutions in the media. Mm -hmm. How do you think about the media's role? Well, you know, I'm, I have a mixed view because I'm a conservative in the mainstream media. Um, <laughs> I have seen, uh, we saw, for example, with Dan Rather during the Bush presidency and the reporting he did on his years in the um, National Guard that turned out to be wrong. I can see that the press can get it wrong because of their predispositions. That's absolutely true. Um, but the more I've uh, been in the media, the more I have valued serious fact-checked sources where when people are exposed, when they do things wrong, there are actual consequences. Instead of uh, essentially market, uh, you know, improvement of their improvement of their market share. And you know, that means we need professional journalism. We need people who have a set of professional standards of fairness that uh, if they get it wrong, that they are fired, that there's something that happens to them. Um, and um, right now, we ha now have a situation where we used to have a fact base, a common fact base, that was like a single mountain where liberals and conservatives said there are different ways up the mountain. I think now we have two mountains, two fact bases that make it impossible to have any serious discussion between them. And that, I think, is a serious issue for democracy. So I, I want to start to at least talk about your thoughts on how we might improve some of this. And you've talked on the polarization side of calling out unfairness. What do you mean by that when you say we need to call out unfairness? Well, usually that means calling out your own. Uh, it doesn't really work if Donald Trump were to call out liberals or Barack Obama are, is to call out conservatives, that's actually often reinforces you know, existing prejudices. Um, but I think it's become very important for people in their own traditions to hold them to account. And that's not an easy thing. There can be a cost to that. Because we do see, for example, a anti-Semitism of the left and some serious problems, ideological problems there. We see the growth of a white nationalism on the right where decent conservatives have to reject it root and branch. Um, and so I think it's going to be increasingly incumbent on people to criticize their own tradition in courageous ways 
if we're to make progress back to some sanity on these issues. Yeah. There, there was a group last year called More in Common that, that looked at uh, this issue of polarization in the United States, and they said, when you actually take out sort of the far right and the far left wings of each party, what you really find is what they called the exhausted majority in the middle. 67% of people, they said, were more practical and less ideological, and that were um, we're liable for many of them to just want to step out of politics altogether. Yeah. Well, do you I, agree with that assessment, and, and how not, do I'm we... I'm not sure, because a lot of this depends, depends on self-assessment in these things, but it disturbs me, for example, that at one point during the Bush administration, during those eight years, I forget which year it was, a majority, more than 50% of polled Democrats thought that, or said that President Bush was complicit in the 9-11 attacks. In the Obama years, at another point, um, more than 50% of Republicans believed that, or said they believed that the president was a Muslim and not an American citizen. Now, I, I'm not sure that those numbers are, you know, whether people believe this or not. I think what they want to do is use any club that they're given on a poll test, uh, test in order to you know, beat the candidate that they don't like. Um, but it has m created a certain susceptibility to uh, conspiracy theories in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, this is not a political statement, it's a factual historical statement that uh, we now have a president who came to prominence in his party by uh, spreading a conspiracy theory about the president's background. That is how he emerged. And that, I think, crosses a very important uh, and disturbing line. Yeah. OK, well, I, I don't want to, I want to end on a slightly more positive note and ask you, you wrote recently about your friend and fellow columnist David Brooks and his project called the Weave Project, where he's been out finding people and communities that are really doing the good work of bringing our country together. What is it that makes you hopeful about our country and its future? Well, I do think there's a decent, a deep decency in American character that can be brought out. Um, I think there are a lot of institutions that do that. They're non-political institutions, the institutions of civil society that humanize us, give us direction, um, you know, determine the most important things about our lives. The health of civic institutions is really the whole ball game when it comes to um, teach inculcating the virtues that are necessary. But I'm also hopeful about a couple of other things. One of them is um, the capacity of leadership to make a difference on these issues. One of my favorite speeches from presidential, uh, uh, presidential history was from Robert F. Kennedy when he was running for president in Indianapolis on the night that Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. And he had to inform a largely African-American audience of this horrible fact. And he presented in an extraordinary speech a conscious choice between hatred and hope, conscious choice between hatred and healing. And he used his own example of his brother dying to say that he had faced that himself. Um, it made a huge difference in Indianapolis on that night, but it also showed what the right kind of empathetic presidential leadership could do. And I'll, I'll add one more thing. Um, I think the high point moment in the last several years when it comes to the, a healing message, an empathetic message, took place in the aftermath of the Charleston attacks when uh, the killer was uh, at a hearing and some of the families of the dead said that they, forgive, they forgave him. Um, it was a moment of grace in American politics that's very rare and very powerful. I think when people see that kind of grace exercise, they say, they look into this abyss that we face and say, we can't go there. Um, there has to be something better. And so I do think that there are plenty of sources of hope in our society. Well, good. Well, will you all please join me in thanking Mike Gerson? Thank you.